Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am uh, Tony, uh, Tony Chien, and I'm uh, so delighted to be here uh, this afternoon uh, to give this talk. And thank you so much for the extremely uh, warm welcome uh, for all of us uh, in this great lecture hall. And uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to International Black Sea University for hosting uh, this talk, uh, which I've titled Great Books, An Introduction to Some Foundational Works of World Literature. Um, first of all, I confess that this is an extremely uh, ambitious topic, um, probably an, an, an impossible one. Um, let me first clarify that my focus won't be on awe of world literature. It will only um, be focused on works from the ancient world. So works from the first century uh, AD and earlier. But even so, the number of literary works that have survived from that period is overwhelming. Is there any one person competent enough to make a selection from the thousands of great works that have survived in the ancient world and call them so-called great? But selections have, made, have been made throughout history, and we who live in the 21st century have the benefit of hindsight. I'll try to make and justify a selection of what I consider the great works of, uh, of the ancient world. So before I do so, let me run through a, a very short uh, outline of what I plan to talk about. Uh, first, I want to take a quick look at the world language families, uh, because when we talk about world literature, we're talking about essentially uh, literature in translation, because no one can possibly master uh, every single language in the world. Uh, second, I wanted to talk a little bit about preservation of written text, how uh, ancient works even survive. Uh, third, um, how, so, how some works actually survive uh, purely by chance. Um, and then finally, uh, actually for the uh, vast majority of my talk, I will be uh, talking about uh, a selection, my selection, of the so-called great works of world literature. And I'm really gl uh, glad to hear that a lot of you here are uh, international uh, relations uh, majors. So uh, I really hope that uh, uh, this uh, talk could be uh, useful for you as you think about uh, you know, uh, your field uh, of international relations. So, here's a graphic of the language families in the world. Uh, linguists, uh, as you may know, classify languages based on how they are related to one another. Uh, Patrick, who is our uh, next speaker, is actually a linguist, I am not, uh, and he uh, will be able to explain this uh, far better than I can. Uh, this uh, is a graphic uh, uh, for the nations of the world that are related uh, by the Indo-European language family. Uh, these languages are the most well-known uh, in the Western world because they include most of the European languages and also some of the languages spoken on the Indian subcontinent. So uh, I hope you can see this, but uh, if, it, if this is not clear, uh, all I'm uh, trying to show here uh, are some of the widely spoken languages in the Indo-European uh, uh, language family. So, for example, under the Italic uh, branch uh, are, uh, is Latin, um, uh, ancient language, uh, which uh, gave rise to the Romance languages like French, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Italian, Romanian. Uh, under the Hellenic uh, branch, uh, there is ancient Greek, medieval Greek, modern Greek. Uh, under the Indic uh, branch. Uh, there's classical Sanskrit and the many languages of, of India. And um, another uh, important language family, so moving on, uh, is the Asiatic uh, family, which includes the Semitic languages uh, like Akkadian and Hebrew. 
A third important language family is Sino-Tibetan, which of course uh, includes uh, Chinese, uh, which is the most widely spoken language in the world. <coughs> the reason I mention these languages is because they, uh, they are represented in the works that I uh, want to talk about uh, today. But uh, of all the literary works that have been written in these languages, how does one arrive at a selection? Well, um, time, as it turns out, is our greatest ally. Time has made extinct many, perhaps even most, of the great works of literature that have ever been written. Time, in that sense, has made the selection for us. Written texts do not usually last very long. One of the most durable materials to write on is stone. So here we have a, a set of Egyptian hieroglyphics carved in stone. Another uh, fairly durable material is clay. So this is a clay tablet uh, with cuneiform letters. A wedge-shaped stylus is used to make these incisions on wet clay, which then dries. Stone and clay tablets uh, can survive for thousands of years, and indeed they have survived for thousands of years. We still have these preserved today. But most other materials perish far, far sooner. Papyrus disintegrates after a few hundred years. This is a picture of a papyrus plant and a papyrus fragment from around the third to second century BC. Paper, uh, first developed in China in the second century AD, is even more fragile and can last for a long time only in very dry climate. It's no surprise that one of the largest collections of surviving writings on paper was found in a sealed Buddhist cave in the desert regions of northwest China. In short, uh, writings don't usually survive unless they are continuously copied, once every few hundred years. But sometimes, some texts survive by chance. Uh, so I like to give the example, which I feel is very compelling, of uh, the three great ancient Greek uh, playwrights Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Of the three, Euripides have the most number of surviving plays, although 19 out of around 90 is not a great uh, percentage. But we know that of the three, he was the least admired by his contemporaries based on how many of his plays won a prize at the festival competitions. So why did more plays by him survive than the other two combined? So this is a little puzzle for you. Uh, here are the titles of the plays by Euripides that survive, listed in alphabetical order. Uh, do you notice anything about these texts? So it's not immediately obvious. Almost half the, of the number of plays that survive begin with the letters Epsilon, Eta, or Iota. Uh, it seems a, a complete collection of the plays of Euripides uh, once existed, and it was arranged alphabetically. And one volume just happened to survive, and that one volume was from the Epsilon to Iota range. Um, so again, uh, as many as as nine out of the 19 plays of Euripides survive, uh, that survive owe their existence uh, to that very fortuitous uh, volume. But this is an extreme uh, case of good fortune, uh, I think, at least for scholars of Greek literature. Uh, survival of literary works is not usually arbitrary. Throughout history, selections of literary works have been made by experts, collected in anthologies, preserved in libraries, and transmitted from generation to generation. Works survive the passage of time 
by a continuous history of selection and transmission might deserved, deservedly claim uh, to be great. But only a very select few can claim a history of continuous transmission. Now, um, my goal for this presentation is, again, to introduce some great works, some foundational works. Um, by foundational, I mean that in some ways, these works have come to stand for their respective cultures. We can't think of these works apart from their cultures. And I think everyone should at least know, um, know about them, if not read them. Uh, I've decided, again, not to consider any works after the first century, and the reason is very practical. Uh, first, I have a limited amount of time. Uh, second, outside of the ancient world, there are just far, far too many works uh, to make a selection that is, not, that is not in some ways arbitrary. Vast quantity makes us numb and is one of the embarrassing truth of literary studies. We just cannot read everything. Uh, one sometimes hopes that there had been a great fire that burned away 99.999% of all literature so we can actually make a selection that's mm -hmm. principled and, in, and intelligent. Um, but as it is, as reality is, we are simply overwhelmed by the quantity. So confining ourselves to works written in the ancient world makes our task a little bit more manageable. Um, so um, I'm trying to cover a period of a little over a thousand years, so let's, let's get started. Uh, the first work I wanted to introduce is the Epic of Gilgamesh, written around 1200 BC. Uh, it is often considered the first great literary, literary composition in ancient uh, Mesopotamia, written in Akkadian, a Semitic language. Uh, though ancient by our standards, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh was already an updated version of a much more ancient tradition. Uh, the hero of the epic, uh, King Gilgamesh, lived sometime around 2750 BC in modern-day Iraq. That is more than 1500 years before the work was composed. So by 1200 BC, he was already a legendary figure. Just out of curiosity, who here has heard of the Epic of Gilgamesh? Hmm. Oh, a, 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 few of, a, a few of you. Uh, actually, I've learned just recently that uh, Gilgamesh has become a very popular character in video games. Hmm. Uh, is, that, is that true? <laughs> uh, uh, does, does anyone, uh, uh, can anyone confirm if, that, if that's the case? Um, anyway, I, I, I've heard that, uh, that uh, recently Gilgamesh has, has become kind of this heroic figure that you can choose uh, to play, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in one of the video games, popular video games. Yes. And it just goes to show uh, how uh, it's still relevant uh, today. Uh, again, the, um, so moving on, the, the work gives us a great opportunity to talk about how literary works are preserved. Uh, this was not a work that was preserved uh, and transmitted continuously. Uh, no one knew about it, actually, for 2,000 years. In the 1850s, it was discovered by an Iraqi archaeologist on clay tablets like this one. The tablets were finally deciphered by this man, George Smith. Um, why did these tablets survive? Um, well, the library that had originally held these tablets was burned down around the 7th uh, century BC. But fortunately, uh, clay tablets, unlike paper, uh, can survive a fire. Actually, they preserve better after they're burned, because after they're burned, they harden. Um, So uh, the story, uh, for those of you who know, this would be uh, just a very brief, uh, a brief summary. The story begins with uh, King uh, Gilgamesh oppressing his people. Uh, the gods, in response to the people's cries, create Enkidu, uh, who is equal to Gilgamesh and who succeeds in restraining him. The two who become friends work together to slay um, the monster Humbaba, 
um, and the bowl sent from heaven. So this is uh, Gilgamesh here, Enkidu here, uh, I believe Gilgamesh here, and Enkidu here. Uh, the climax of the work, however, occurs when Enkidu dies by the decree of the gods. Gilgamesh is distraught because he knows that he too must one day die. Here's a passage that shows why the epic of Gilgamesh still resonates today. So this is straight from the work. Over his friend Enkidu, Gilgamesh cried bitterly, roaming the wilderness. I am going to die. Am I not like Enkidu? Deep sadness penetrates my core. I fear death and now roam the wilderness. Gilgamesh uh, decides to seek out a man named Utanapishtim. Right here. Uh, Utanapishtim uh, is a man who once survived the worldwide flood and now holds the secret to immortality. Uh, Gilgamesh meets Utanapishtim. He receives a plant that will give him immortality only to have it stolen from him by a serpent. At the end, Gilgamesh surveys the great walls of his city and seems to find comfort in them. He declares, examine its foundation, inspect its brickwork thoroughly. Is not even the core of the brick structure of kiln-fired brick? And did not the seven sages themselves lay out its plan? One league city, one league palm gardens, one league lowlands, the open area of the Ishtar temple, three leagues, and the open area of Uruk, the wall encloses. Ultimately, the Epic of Gilgamesh is a great work, I think, because it addresses some of the fundamental questions of humanity, life and death, friendship, honor, and fame. The story of Utanapishtim and the worldwide flood should remind us of the most famous flood story in the world, Noah's flood. The serpent that steals the plant of immortality also should remind us of the serpent in the Garden of Eden who tempts Eve to take the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These are two of the most well-known stories in our second great work of world literature, the Hebrew Bible. And who here has heard of or read uh, the Hebrew Bible uh, by a show of hands? Okay, a, a, few, a few of you. So I think this is a good time to think about how great works of literature influence one another. It's not a coincidence that the flood appears in both the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Hebrew Bible. If there is any doubt, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, we read how Utanapishtim, remember the man who held the secret to immortality, the man who survived the flood, how after the flood, uh, after the rain stopped, um, he released a dove uh, to see if the waters had receded. Uh, for those of you who know the story of Noah's flood, uh, will certainly remember that that is exactly what happens uh, in the Bible, exactly what Noah does. Uh, this detail is too similar for it to be a coincidence, mm -hmm. but also very clearly the story uh, of, fl of the flood in the Bible is very different from uh, the flood in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, in the Bible, the flood is sent by God because of the wickedness of humanity. In Gilgamesh, we don't know why the gods decided to send the flood. We are simply not told. Did the writer of Gilgamesh borrow from the story in the Bible? Or did the biblical writer borrow from the epic of Gilgamesh? Or did they both draw from a common oral or literary source? Uh, I think that uh, Gil Hebrew Bible borrowed this story from Gilgamesh because 
we know the historical fact that uh, Hebrew tribes were like uh, migrated in Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. and they have it's uh, also it's the same region, same habitat they live in lived in. So I think, and also the Mesopotamian culture is elder than Hebrew culture, and uh, they can just hear about this, and they can just like uh, knew about this, and uh, it's the reason I think. Great, uh, thank you, thank you for 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 your reason. Uh, I. I'm not sure uh, whether we can definitively say that the Mesopotamian culture is more ancient than Hebrew culture, um, but uh, in terms of written evidence, you are correct. Uh, we have more ancient texts preserved uh, from ancient Mesop Mesopotamia than we do for uh, the Hebrew Bible, than for the Hebrew culture. But you must remember, though, that uh, Hebrew culture uh, was oral uh, for uh, many, many centuries. So actually, we don't know. Uh, we, again, based on the texts, true, uh, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia is more ancient, but uh, you, uh, we can't discount uh, the fact that uh, an oral culture can go back for much farther, and we just have no evidence of it. Um, but thank you, thank you so much for, for uh, uh, you are uh, entirely correct that uh, Mesopotamia is more ancient textually uh, than the Bible. Um, so uh, again, for those of us who might believe that the Bible is, is, is true, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, uh, Gilgamesh's reference to the flood would be evidence uh, that the flood actually happened, right? It's a, corroborating evidence that a worldwide flood actually happened. Uh, the Bible uh, gives us also a great example of the importance of literature to the building of a nation. Uh, literature uh, uh, does not mean fiction, right? It does not mean that things are made up. Literature, more, more broadly speaking, is narrative. Um, the Bible fundamentally is a narrative about the nation of Israel. Uh, the Bible gives us the famous story of Abraham who followed God and believed in God's promise to make him the father of a great nation. In obedience to God's command, he was prepared to offer his son Isaac on the altar. So uh, in the book of Genesis in the Bible, um, uh, we are given the scene uh, where Abraham is about to sacrifice his son. And who here knows the story of Abraham's uh, sacrifice of his son? Great, uh, actually quite a, quite a few of you. Uh, um, so this is a, a passage from that scene, just as Abraham is about to sacrifice his son. Uh, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. This is a picture of uncompromising faith and divine provision that has epitomized the relationship between the nation of Israel and her God. Abraham's grandson Jacob, also named Israel, had 12 sons uh, who are the ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel. On the left, we have a, a picture of another famous story in the Bible uh, many of you might have also heard of this, when uh, Joseph was sold uh, by his brothers who were jealous that he was the favorite son of their father. Uh, he uh, was sold to Egypt. In Egypt, he became a, a prime minister uh, to Pharaoh, uh, the king of Egypt. Um, eventually, Jacob and his other sons arrive in Egypt. They reunite uh, with Joseph. Uh, after uh, some time, the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, 
And the story and the picture to the right is uh, the story of Moses who delivered oh, Israel uh, uh, and uh, helped Israel uh, um, uh, out of this, uh, uh, took Israel out of slavery in Egypt. The Bible goes on to tell the history of the nation of Israel and their future redemption. Uh, so I really, uh, truly believe this is a quintessential work, a foundational work. It records the history of a nation, the laws that make that nation distinct from every other nation. It's a story of origin, it's a story of identity. Without the Bible, we can say, I think, and that, I think this is true, there is no Israel. The oldest texts of the Hebrew Bible sur survive among the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in the mid-20th century in the Qumran Caves, dated to the last centuries BC. These texts are written on, on parchment and papyrus. This is one of the rare cases where we can actually compare the texts that we have, which have been copied and transmitted over the centuries, to these texts that were preserved from 2,000 years ago. The fact that the texts are extremely similar shows that the transmission process over the centuries was very carefully and faithfully done. Uh, so moving on, uh, let's talk about a, a literature that is actually closer to this part of the, um, uh, even, even closer uh, to this part of the world, uh, the Homeric epics. So the Iliad and the Odyssey written around the 8th century BC. And who here has heard of uh, Homer or, or the uh, epics? These are very long works. Uh, the Iliad tells the story of the Trojan War. Uh, during which the Greeks besieged the city of Troy. Who here has seen the movie Troy from 2004? Okay, more, more people <laughs> uh, um, have seen the movie. Uh, this is, the movie was based off of uh, the, the Iliad. Uh, the story centers on Achilles, the great Greek hero, and his refusal to fight in the war after being slighted by the leader of the Greek army. Uh, the poem begins, uh, Raz, Sing, O goddess, of the son of Peleus, of Achilles, the destructive wrath which myriad, myriad woes upon the Achaeans uh, did bring. Uh, as the Trojans advance upon the Greek forces, Achilles' closest companion is killed by the tr uh, Trojan Hector. So in uh, the painting, uh, actually the, the clay uh, artwork, uh, I mean pottery art artwork on, on the right, um, we have a, a picture of Achilles uh, defeating uh, Hector. Uh, Achilles kills Hector to avenge his friend. Uh, and at the end uh, of the Iliad, uh, we have a scene, a very famous scene, of the heartbreaking plea of Hector's father to Achilles to please uh, return his son's body uh, to him. Um, the Odyssey uh, follows the events of the Iliad it tells of King Odyssey's journey back home after the end of the Trojan War. The, the poem begins, A man, tell me, O muse, one of many turns, who exceedingly much did suffer after the sacred citadel of Troy he did sack. Odysseus encounters many obstacles, including an encounter with the Cyclops. In order to escape the Cyclops, he blinds him uh, in a famous scene depicted here on Greek pottery. The Odyssey has tended to be more popular, popular among readers over the ages because it deals with the universal theme of a journey home. Uh, but for their original audience, the Iliad might have been more important since it described the culture-defining battle with the, with the Trojans and therefore what it meant uh, to be Greek. Now, how did the Iliad and the Odyssey survive? Uh, like I said, uh, they were written on, mostly on papyrus, papyrus uh, disintegrate after a few, only a few centuries. So these epics could survive only when they are copied uh, for uh, centuries. Uh, I mean, after every few centuries, uh, a new copy would have to be made for them to, to survive. Uh, who here knows, uh, who's heard of Alexander the Great? Uh, all, all of you. <laughs> um, did you know that Alexander the Great uh, played a, a, an essential role to the preservation of the Iliad 
and the Odyssey. Mm. Um, so actually here on the, on the right, uh, we have Aristotle with the young Alexander. Aristotle, uh, of course, the famous Greek philosopher, uh, was a teacher of, of Alexander. Mm. And Alexander uh, loved Homer so much, especially the Iliad, that he had his teacher Aristotle prepare a special annotated edition uh, of the Iliad. And he would carry the Iliad with him wherever he went. You know, when, he, when he went on his conquest, he would uh, supposedly, uh, purportedly, he would have the Iliad even as his, uh, you know, underneath his pillow. Uh, that's how much he loved it. And because of Alexander and the conquest of Alexander, uh, Homer was spread through the rest of the uh, you know, Western world and became a Western uh, classic. We now turn to a different part of the world, uh, which did not have much interaction with the Western world until well after the ancient period. This is the Chinese Empire, not the earliest civilization in human history, but the longest continuing one. Uh, it is rather remarkable that one man, uh, Confucius, came to define mainstream Chinese culture. I'm sure everyone here has heard of Confucius, is that right? Am I <laughs> assuming too much? Who, who has not heard of Confucius? <laughs> okay, or, or, or you don't have to admit it here, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so Confucius uh, was an inheritor of an already ancient tradition. Uh, the Analects uh, of Confucius, uh, which is a collection of sayings by him, co um, collected by his students, um, has this uh, famous phrase, uh, the master said, a transmitter and not a maker, believing in and loving the ancients. So he is speaking about himself. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this kind of uh, uh, structure, the master said, has given rise to one of the uh, uh, <laughs> unfortunate <laughs> things uh, in, in American culture that you might know about, which is the fortune cookie. Who, ha who here knows about, uh, knows about what the fortune cookie is? When you crack it, there is a thing right next to So for those of you who don't know, uh, in Chinese restaurants in America, uh, after you eat, they usually hand out these fortune cookies, and you would crack them, and there would be a little slip, that sometimes says Confucius says, and then there will be uh, some, you know, fortune or, or some saying. Uh, of course, none of them are actually by Confucius, but this is where it comes from, uh, the Analects, uh, this kind of structure of the master said or Confucius said and, and, some, and, and something that follows. Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, Confucius uh, never claimed to be an original a thinker, he was a transmitter. So five of the six classical texts, often ca called the Confucian classics, existed well before the time of Confucius. Confucius is thought to have composed the Spring and An Autumn Annals, uh, which is a bare chronicle of events that happened over a period of centuries in the state of Lu, which is Confucius's hometown. The other five texts that are associated with Confucius um, um, are associated with him because uh, it was thought that Confucius edited them. So I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, I was going to uh, uh, give, um, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the classic of poetry, but um, I think uh, just for the sake of time, I'll move on. But I really encourage all of you at least to take a look uh, at the classic of poetry, uh, one of the, one of the uh, six classics. Uh, it's a collection of, of, of uh, the most ancient Chinese uh, poems and, and very beautiful poems, I believe. So uh, I really encourage you when you have time to take a look, take a look at that. Uh, moving on, uh, we um, come to another uh, part of the world, uh, South Asia uh, and the literature of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, Indian literature is unique because it's notoriously difficult to date. All early texts in South Asia were preserved by memorization and not written down until much, much later. So actually to go back to uh, the gentleman who, who mentioned about how we date, how do we know that ancient Mesopotamia was a more ancient culture than ancient Israel? Uh, so in the case of India, we have a very, very good case 
where we have no idea how ancient this culture is because for hundreds of years, even thousands of years, everything was transmitted orally. So, uh, so the Ma Mahabharata, which is one of the great works of um, Indian literature, uh, wasn't written down until centuries after it was composed. So we can only guess that this was composed uh, sometime uh, near the end of, um, uh, uh, sometime during the last centuries uh, BC. Uh, the Mahabharata is actually a very, very well-known text in India today. Uh, it has, I heard just a few days ago that there's a TV show based on the Mahabharata, uh, a TV series based on the Mahabharata. Has anyone watched uh, this TV series or know about this TV series? Uh, okay, may, maybe not, not here, but I, I haven't. Uh, but it turns out that I think young people in India uh, all watch this uh, TV series. So, um, so it, it's still very well known today. Um, um, to give a sense of how work is, it's seven times the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. So oh it's extremely long work. Uh, it seeks to be comprehensive, right? As it says, whatever is found here may well be found elsewhere. What is not here is nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's hard to summarize what this work is about because it claims to be about everything, poetry, history, philosophy, religion, um, and so forth. Um, but the one event that ties everything together in the Mahabharata is the struggle for the throne between two groups of first cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. One of the most famous passages in the Mahabharata is the dice game, uh, which is a microcosm of the antagonism between the Karavas and the Pandavas. And I just like to give a summary of it because I think it's a such a great it's a such a great story. Um, so Yudhishthira, who is a Pandava prince, that's a, a painting of him uh, to the right. Um, he's challenged to play a game of dice uh, against Shakuni who is a relative of a Kaurava prince. Uh, Yudhishthira appears to know that it's a trap, but he plays anyway. Um, he says, fearful gamblers have been brought together, experts in the art who use deceit. But the world, they say, is in the power of fate. I will not fail to gamble with the experts. So he goes and he plays this game with Shakuni. He loses the first game. He loses the second game. He just keeps on losing. He wagers his fortune. He wagers his brothers. He wagers himself. And finally, he wagers his wife, which is the big no-no. Mm -hmm. um, so he, uh, his wife, uh, um, Draupadi, uh, is led into the hall and humiliated by having her dress stripped. Uh, Draupadi cries out, shame, shame, the law of Bharatas, the warrior code of honor is destroyed. When all the Kurus gathered here at court see how the law of the Kurus is transgressed. As she speaks, she casts a sidelong glance at the Pandavas, and we are told, not their lost kingdom, not the wealth, not all the lost gems of highest price gave Pandu's sons such pain as Draupadi gave by that one anguished, <laughs> sidelong glance. Um, now, to protect her in this very famous uh, scene, Lord Krishna, a Hindu god, intervenes and adds length to her, to her dress as she is being stripped. So she's never uh, unclothed. So uh, um, I hope you can see in this scene how uh, uh, Krishna, on the upper right corner, uh, sends down uh, strips of clothing so that uh, she is uh, she keeps her honor and this is uh, again one of the uh, most famous scenes in this in this work uh, and to just summarize a little bit about what happens at the end uh, so basically uh, again not to go into the details the Kauravas and the Pandavas over this incident they go to war almost everyone dies on the battlefield and it's just a very depressing uh, very depressing work Uh, moving on, uh, let's round, round uh, out our works with the ancient world 
uh, by going back uh, to the West. Uh, the Aeneid uh, by Virgil is the single most important work of Roman literature. Um, can I get a show of hands of who has uh, heard of the Aeneid or who has read the Aeneid? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, not, not many of you. I'm, I'm actually a, a bit surprised. More of you uh, uh, ha have heard of Homer and read uh, the Homeric epics than uh, the Aeneid. Um, uh, Virgil modeled the Aeneid very consciously on the Homeric epics. Uh, one could say that Virgil set out to create a great book, even to outdo Homer. Right? He, he saw Homer as his uh, uh, a great predecessor, but someone whom he wanted to uh, even uh, do uh, better than. Uh, so the poem, um, oh, by the way, this is a, a bust of the Emperor Augustus, uh, the first emperor of Rome, and Virgil, Virgil on the right. Uh, the poem begins, uh, Arms and a man I sing, who first from the shores of Troy came to Italy, exiled by fate and to Lavinian coasts, much he was tossed about both on land and at sea, by the force of the gods, on account of the mindful wrath of cruel, cruel Juno. Intentionally, Virgil wanted this epic to be a combination of the Homeric epics, whereas Homer wrote about war and battles in the Iliad and a, journeys, and a journey home in the Odyssey, a Virgil was going to write about both, arms and a man. Uh, the first six books tells the story of Aeneas's journey from the defeated city of Troy to the, shro uh, to the shores of Italy, in some way reenacting re Odysseus's journey home, with the difference being that Aeneas was not going home, but going to establish a new home. Aeneas is known for his piety. Uh, piety is not only one's duty to one's parents, uh, as, uh, it's also one's duty to the gods. And piety is the greatest Roman virtue. In one famous scene uh, in Book Two, uh, which showcases Aeneas's piety, he carries his father as they es as they escape Troy, as the Greeks uh, approach to um, to conquer the city. Um, and he says to his father, "Come, come, then, dear father, clasp my neck. I will carry you on my shoulders. That task won't weigh on me." Whatever may happen, it will be for us both the same shared risk, the same salvation. In book four, probably the most famous book in the Aeneid, so, if any, so a lot of you, again, haven't read this book, and if you had to choose, I would recommend book four of the Aeneid. Um, the whole, the whole uh, epic poem is 12 books, so uh, book four uh, um, is the most famous. Uh, this is where Aeneas' piety toward the gods is tested uh, when the Trojans uh, stop by Carthage, the city of Carthage, and Queen Dido falls in love with Aeneas. She tries to persuade him to stay and not go to Italy. Aeneas is tempted to forget his mission, but when reminded, he ultimately obeys the will of the gods. He spurns Dido, who in one of the most depicted scenes in Western painting commits suicide. Before she takes her own life, Dido declares this curse mm -hmm. for telling the future wars between Rome and Carthage. So this is Dido speaking. Then, O Tyrians, pursue my hatred against this whole line and the race to come and offer it as a tribute to my ashes. Let there be no love or treaties between our peoples. In the final six books, Aeneas lands on the coast of Italy and a series of battles ensue between the Trojans and the local king. Um, at the end, it's, uh, it's suggested, it's not made explicit, but Aeneas lands in Italy to found, eventually, the city of Rome. Uh, so this is a story, uh, in a way, of how the Roman Empire came into being. Virgil writes this line, so hard was the task to found the Roman people. <clears throat> Ancient sources tell us that Virgil did not manage to finish the Aeneid before his death and wanted the manuscript destroyed because he wasn't perfectly happy with it. 
The Emperor Augustus, however, overruled Virgil's wishes and kept the manuscript. Uh, before long, the Aeneid became a standard text in Roman schools, not only because it was a great piece of literature, it was also great Roman propaganda. From then on, uh, it was used as a text to teach the language of the empire, Latin. Without the Roman Empire, there would be no Aeneid. Because of the Roman Empire, the Aeneid survived over the centuries and is now one of the best known texts in the Western world. Every one of you, I assume, has heard of the New Testament. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I've been, uh, uh, some of us in our group have gone on, on uh, some tours of, uh, of your city and we've looked at some old uh, uh, Christian uh, monasteries and Christian churches here and we know how long a history, uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, history this country uh, has had. And actually I, I learned this uh, on the tours that uh, Georgia is one of the first country, uh, first nations to uh, adopt Christianity as its a state religion, uh, actually even before the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, early uh, Christianity was born out of the same culture centered on the temple in Jerusalem that revered the Hebrew Bible. For Jesus, uh, the Hebrew Bible was holy scripture. The claims of Jesus of Nazareth that he was the Son of God and God himself were unprecedented. For Christians, the death of Jesus on the cross uh, saved mankind from their sins, and his resurrection gave hope for mankind's victory over death. On the day of resurrection, the Apostle John writes of the scene where Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' female followers, <clears throat> discovered that the tomb where Jesus was buried uh, was empty. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. The four Gospels are often considered examples of ancient biographies, though of course no biography had ever told a life quite like Jesus's. They record the sayings and miracles of Jesus in a way that leaves no question about his claims to divinity. The other major part of the New Testament are letters. Uh, the most famous of the letters are those by Paul of Tarsus, um, carefully composed to address specific issues in the early churches, as well as elucidating a theology of salvation by grace alone as he writes in his letter to the church in Ephesus, for grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In the very beginning of the so-called Jesus movement, the Romans probably thought of Christianity as just one of many religious groups that would not acknowledge the emperor and the Roman gods. Increasingly, they took it more seriously and persecuted Christians severely. Pliny the Younger wrote a famous letter to the emperor Trajan early in the second century, describing how he dealt with people accused of being Christians. He had them executed unless they did three things. One, repeat a formula of invocation to the Roman gods, two, make offerings to the emperor's statue, and three, denounce the name of Christ. Despite this persecution, Christianity triumphed. After the emperor Constantine embraced Christianity, it eventually became the, the official religion of the Roman Empire 
in 380. Uh, in Georgia, I believe Christianity uh, became the state religion in, actually, who, who knows the year? Um, does anyone know? The fourth century. Fourth century. Fourth. Yeah. Nino, eh? say Nino. Fourth, fourth century. Yeah, say right? Nino. What? Okay. Uh, is there is there someone who knows the exact date? That's very early. Three twenty five twenty six. Wow. Wow. That's so so actually, uh, uh, almost sixty years before uh, it became mm -hmm. uh, the uh, religion, official religion of the Roman Empire. Roman. Um, with uh, the New Testament, we come uh, to the end of our excursus through the great literary works of the ancient world. Uh, again, what makes a text great? Uh, I've suggested a few criteria. One, that it, they address some big questions, life and death, fate, the afterlife. Two, that they are sources of cultural and national identity. I remember the Hebrew Bible and the nation of Israel as one uh, uh, obvious example. Three, that they tell stories of origin. Um, so think of the Aeneid and how it tells the story of how the Roman Empire began, or even the Bible about how the people of Israel, uh, what, 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 what was the origin of the people of Israel. Now, des designating the first century as the cutoff line means ignoring many important texts that came after, and having to select only a few texts in the thousand year period that I've covered means neglecting many that could have been included. But it's, the, it's in the nature of selections that one selects those works that one knows best, and these are the works that I know best. Mm. Um, and I'd like to leave uh, with you with the question, uh, if there is a text that you feel uh, should be included um, on my list. And if so, please do uh, let me know. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Mm, great.